Well, thank you, Dr. Tor Church, for such a provocative and sort of visionary talk. And there's, for those of you who are in this field, um, there's so much rich genius and complexity and, and uh, science behind all those slides. But I also know at the same time um, that there's a lot of question in this audience. You know, what's the role of technology to slice and dice and, as some people have said, to play God um, in terms of shaping people's health and destiny. And if it's okay, I'm just gonna assume it's okay to share our discussion on the sideline, to put this into context. Um, I was talking with Dr. Church and Dr. Chisholm, who's here from MIT, and we were talking about supplements. You know, what supplements do you take? And, um, and the notion was, yeah, these may help, but what Dr. Church shared candidly was, if we really want to go for the end goal and to sort of reduce suffering, and those are my words, and, and extend life and, and health and quality, he thinks that we need to really get in there and, and change the code. That's going to be the most direct path. And so what I want to share is this sort of yin-yang complexity between compassion and empathy for health and life and technology. The, the soft touch and the high tech, and, and I think that's sort of the spirit of this talk today. So um, with that, we're gonna move on now, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, our panel um, organizer, Dr. John Denninger, um, who's gonna coordinate the next three presenters uh, and then facilitate a discussion, including Dr. Church and the three presenters um, at this table. Uh, Dr. Denninger is a friend and colleague. He's a director of research, he's my counterpart, um, at the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Research at Mass General Hospital, and he's also an instructor in psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School. And his own research is at the forefront of understanding the genetic and epigenetic impacts of things as opposite as these manipulations, mind-body therapies. So um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jenninger. So thanks, Peter. Thanks, Dr. Church. That was incredible. Um, I'm going to take out my notes so I know what to say. That's always useful. How's everyone doing? Good. Fantastic. All right. So, um, so Peter just said it, but I'll say it again. So we're going to, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes. We're going to uh, bring up three speakers. Then afterwards, the three speakers and Dr. Church are going to sit there, and we're going to, I'm going to moderate the questions that you guys are already entering on Slido, right? Lots of really exciting, interesting questions, yes? Good. Fantastic. Keep going with that. Um, all right. So what we're going to be doing in these three talks um, is essentially taking like a little walk, uh, a walk down biology. We're going to be starting with genes uh, and DNA. Um, genes, uh, DNA of course is where genes live. Uh, they live in the nucleus, just to remind people. And genes come in different alleles. People are familiar with that concept, right? Different alleles. It's like back in high school biology, you may have learned some, you know, like a, a gene for uh, blue eyes or, or something like that. And you might inherit different alleles from your two parents. Well, that's why Dr. Church was mentioning the importance of having genomes that keep intact the information of who, who, which of your parent, which gene came from which of your parents. Um, our first talk uh, by Catherine Hall um, is going to show uh, the kind of gene-based precision medicine um, that's being used in things like cancer treatment and showing that that can also be used to understand uh, how vitamins and supplements and even food are interacting uh, with our bodies. Uh, our genes influence which foods and vitamins are good for us, and uh, maybe even which ones are bad for us. After that, we're going to turn to changes to DNA. Uh, so changes to DNA in the sense of not changes to the DNA sequence. You guys know that for the most part, you're born with a DNA sequence, right? And that exists throughout your lifespan. These are changes to the structure of DNA using um, uh, chemical moieties like DNA methylation. So these are, this is what's called epigenetics. Have people heard that term, epigenetics, the epigenome? Olivia Okereke is going to be talking about that, showing that um, uh, even with the genes you are born with, lifestyle and stress can lead to epigenetic changes which regulate how, ultimately, how genes get expressed. Does anyone remember what messenger RNA is? 
people in, in the room know what that is. So messenger RNA is essentially what gets expressed from genes. If a gene gets turned on, the first step in the process that leads to the production of protein is messenger RNA. Um, uh, that starts a cascade that then leads to, I'm a protein biochemist, so it's sort of my favorite thing, leads to the production of proteins. Proteins are, they're not just things you get in a powder and uh, eat if you're trying to build muscle. Proteins are things like specific molecules that do specific functions in the body. Things like hemoglobin, have people heard of hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is the protein that of course exists in red blood cells. It's the thing that makes them red and it's the protein that carries oxygen for our bodies. Manoj Basin is going to be talking about how mind and body practices, uh, practices like meditation and yoga and, and the like, turn genes on and off that are involved in the immune system, in inflammation, and downstream from that are important for uh, risk of illness. So a few things I want to keep people in mind. These are going to be short talks, by the way, very quick. So, um, uh, so you have to pay close attention while people are talking. But so, some things I want you to keep in mind while these, are, uh, these talks are going on. One is that the interaction between uh, genes and environment is always a two-way street, right? There is interaction on genes and how they are expressed from the environment, and there obviously also is influence on how we respond to the environment based on our genes. Um, precision medicine, you know, which is can be amazing for things like curing someone's cancer in a very in an individual's specific cancer. Um, that kind of approach also applies to integrative medicine approaches as well. It's not unreasonable to think that a certain supplement or a certain kind of practice might be very specifically important for a given individual depending on what their uh, genetic background is. Um, and then uh, finally, I just wanted to say that sort of all these biological levels that I've been talking about from DNA to the epigenetics to messenger RNA to the uh, transcriptome, um, they are all um, uh, addressable um, by what we choose to do as human beings. What we choose to eat, how we choose to uh, live our lives, whether we smoke, whether we exercise, um, whether we engage in mind-body practices and the like. Um, in a lot of ways, it's sort of like the brain, what's the brain for? I'm a psychiatrist, so I like the brain. The brain is there to integrate what's going on in the environment, right? The brain allows us to take that information in and use it to, uh, to change our internal milieu. Um, uh, making sure that that internal milieu can be appropriately adjusted. Lifestyle choices that are encouraged by integrative medicine uh, interventions can profoundly affect that milieu. That's the bottom line of what I think we're trying to incorporate here. And I just have to say that it's pretty incredible that the Osher Center has brought together this group of people to talk about um, these incredible ideas. All right, so the first person to talk is gonna be Catherine Hall. Catherine is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Um, she's an associate molecular biologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and director of the placebo genetics uh, in the program for placebo studies based uh, uh, at BIDMC and uh, Harvard Medical School. So Catherine works on the pharmacogenomics of placebos and supplements. Uh, with an emphasis on aspirin and vitamins uh, and cancer and also in cardiovascular disease prevention. So she's going to be starting us off on that path I was talking about before, um, starting with uh, DNA and genes. She's going to be talking about how different alleles of genes can determine how much vitamins and other supplements can be helpful or even potentially harmful for your health. And what, what is that? That's precision medicine. Please welcome Catherine Hall. So Dr. Church um, gave us a really wonderful futuristic view of how we're going to be able to change ourselves, make ourselves better, stronger, faster from within, from within our genome. Um, but everybody here sitting in this audience, including myself, we're stuck with what we have right now. And um, we have actually, um, if you think about it, um, half of U.S. adults Think about this problem, how are they going to stay healthy, how are they going to prevent disease every day, 
And every one of us turns down that aisle at CVS or Whole Foods with all those vitamins and supplements. And as soon as you turn that aisle, you become your own pharmacist. You become your own physician. And you have to make decisions about, are you going to swallow your vitamins? Are you going to chew them? Are you going to even now you can vape them? Um, and you have to make a decision about, you know, uh, which combination you're going to need. Think about it. You're going to put vitamin E, vitamin C, a multivitamin, and let me get a supplement. Let me get some fisetin, some quercetin. And we make these crazy cocktails every morning when you take your vitamins or at night. And really, we're going on what the label says, what our friends say, what our parents did to us when we were little, um, gave us our, our chewy vitamins. Um, and for the most part, we're going on what the media says. And if you listen to the media, um, things really go back and forth because the bottom line is that even though half of, the Amer half of Americans use vitamins and supplements, we don't know if they work. And we don't know if they work, not because the animal studies haven't demonstrated really amazing things where the antioxidants pr protect, um, as uh, Dr. Church um, intimated, antioxidants protect from aging, can prevent disease in animals. Um, and we've worked out these elaborate biochemical pathways that are very compelling. And we've done observational studies where we've asked, you know, people who have used multivitamins or vitamins or antioxidants whether or not they're healthy. And we've shown that actually when you do these observational studies, that actually there's a benefit to some people for using these supplements. But when we do clinical trials, we don't get a difference. Here's a, um, a really um, large clinical trial, 40,000 women, the Women's Health Study. They were randomized to vitamin E or aspirin for 10 years, um, and there was no difference at the end of those 10 years in rates of cardiovascular disease or cancer. So why do vitamins fail to show efficacy in clinical trials? Well, that's a question that, that we are very interested in because I think we all kind of know deep down, and that's why we're still taking them, that they do work for some people. But who do they work for? And so that's the, essentially the question that I've been asking. And we've zoomed in on several genes that we study. And I just want to walk you through what we know about one of the genes. And what, this gene, I'm going to talk to you really briefly to give you a sense of the complexity of this question and the potential of this question is COMT, or catechol omethyltransferase. And that's a fancy name for a protein. And we've heard about proteins. They're coded by genes. That protein basically takes this CH3 group in the top right here. Let's see if I can get a cursor. Um, that's called a methyl group, and it sticks it on catecholamines. And this is really amazing because catecholamines are dopamine in your brain, epinephrine and norepinephrine make your heart beat um, uh, important for fight or flight, and Catechol estrogen, which is a breakdown of estrogen, and estrogen is really important in, for many things, um, our reproductive health, but also in protecting us or increasing our risks of cancer. So here's one enzyme that can modify catecholamines that work across multiple systems. So what happens when we have genetic differences in that one enzyme? Well, I work on a polymorphism um, that is called... Um, RS4680. That means that at one locus, one place in the gene, a G gets changed to an A. And that might not seem like a big change, and in fact, there are half a billion changes that can happen or more in the body because you're constantly trying to put together all those little bases that make up all those A's and C's and T's and G's that make up your whole genome. So we're bound to make mistakes. Sometimes it's not a mistake. Sometimes it's intentional. And when you get a G, that changes to an A, the activity of this enzyme is decreased threefold. And what does that look like? So think about it. If I have a very active enzyme that's breaking down my dopamine very efficiently, after I eat that chocolate bar, it's over for me. I am, I'm, I'm going to now, you know, my dopamine is broken down, so I need to n maybe eat another chocolate bar or, or maybe move on to something else. So if I have high activity comped, I have less dopamine. I also have less epinephrine, less norepinephrine. I'm probably less um, prone to stress, as opposed to if I have the low activity allele. I tend to, um, I tend to 
have more dopamine, more epinephrine, I experience more pain. And there's been an amazing, um, this is the most popularly studied uh, uh, polymorphism in, in psychology. And because of that, we know a lot about the types of people that have this polymorphism. Remember, this is one gene, but it has some very interesting effects. And I just want to show you what we found in the Women's Health Study. Because we asked the question, because we knew that COMT was associated with placebo, what happens in the placebo arm of the Women's Health Study? And I'm going to show you what happens. In, black line, in these black lines are what happens to the people in this study, um, uh, in the Women's Health Study. The met-met women on placebo had the most cardiovascular disease. The way this graph works is it's the 10 years of the trial on the x-axis and the rate of cardiovascular diseases on the y-axis. And if you're high on this axis, you have more disease. So the MetMet women had high rates of cardiovascular disease on placebo, but when they took vitamin E, their rates were significantly better. These women benefited from the antioxidant supplement vitamin E, as opposed to the other women, the high-activity comp people. They did better on placebo, but when they took vitamin E, their rates of cardiovascular disease increased. Now, we've looked at this in several other studies. We've looked at what happened with aspirin in that clinical trial. We saw the same thing. Um, we've looked at clonidine in a trial of chronic fatigue syndrome. We essentially saw the same thing. Um, on the screen are tolcapone, which is a drug that targets COMT for Parkinson's. So basically, um, they're trying to basically block count from breaking down dopamine, so there's more dopamine available to Parkinson's. But think about it. When you start messing with comp, you're messing with dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, catechol, estrogen. This is complex stuff. We also know that comp breaks down paroxetine, Paxil, um, and it breaks down phenytoin, which is a, a drug that's used for epilepsy. So the bottom line here is that this is just one gene with many drugs. And here's the kicker. When you walk down that aisle at Whole Foods this evening, tomorrow, this weekend, remember, you're going to be crossing many, many drugs that are metabolized by COMT. You need to know your genotype. Obviously, we need to do more to test this and to validate it. But when you see quercetin, fisetin, s methionine is the donor, is the, is the molecule that's giving the methyl group to COMT, that's sold in Whole Foods. All of these drugs are catechols that are degraded by COMT. So my take-home message is diseases are complex, genes are even more complex, and the drugs that we use to treat them are doing multiple things, and we really need to start digging into what genes, what drugs, what diseases, and how all these things interact. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was outstanding. Um, so next we have uh, Dr. Olivia Okereke. So Olivia is an associate professor of psychiatry and an associate professor of epidemiology at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard Chan uh, School of Public Health. And she's director of uh, geriatric psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. A fun fact, uh, Olivia was one of my chief residents when I was a resident in psychiatry at uh, MGH McLean. Um, Olivia works on ways to identify what we would call like modifiable factors, things like diet and exercise, uh, which are involved in adverse mental aging, which I think I'm going through daily now. Um, <laughs> Uh, she's also working to take that understanding, to take that research and integrate it into strategies for large-scale improvements, sort of public health level uh, improvements uh, in late life uh, depression and cognitive decline. Um, and I'm just hoping that she finishes all that work before I get a lot older. That's my, my wish. So uh, Olivia's talk is going to take us further down the trail I was talking about before, uh, moving from genes and alleles to epigenetics to changes in uh, things like DNA meth methylation, showing how changes in lifestyle can alter the structure of uh, DNA um, in a way that can control how genes are turned on and off. Uh, please welcome Olivia Okereke. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Wayne and everyone at the Osher Center uh, for this opportunity because the work that I'll be describing actually was funded uh, by the Osher Center, was supported by the Osher Center. 
Uh, so I'll be talking about how stress relates to biological aging. And the way that this came about for me, I was very interested in the idea of how biological aging could be a readout of the impact of stress on the body, um, as stress is one of many modifiable factors of interest. Uh, so for example, we can think about um, the telomere, which is something that I've been looking at over the years. And there have been a number of studies that have shown relations between depression, anxiety, psychosocial stress, and modifiable lifestyle factors like cigarette smoking or exercise on telomere shortening. Um, and the mechanisms hypothesized um, involve, for example, increases in inflammation and oxidative stress, which may precipitate accelerated telomere shortening or telomere erosion. And given the fact that part of the role of the telomere is actually to protect integrity of DNA, uh, genomic stability, um, there's also this interesting potential for feedback where uh, telomere erosion accelerated can lead to increased DNA damage which may uh, set up um, uh, consequences for worse mitochondrial function, which spin off more reactive oxygen uh, species and greater oxidative stress. And there can kind of be almost a vicious circle, if you will. Um, so this has been something that's been a tremendous area of interest uh, with regard to the telomere. But I had a lot of interest in sort of looking at some other biomarkers of aging. Um, and that's kind of what led to this uh, study looking at epigenetic aging. So the particular vehicle for this is DNA methylation A or what's been known as an epigenetic clock. So briefly, this was developed um, by um, the particular clock we're using is not the only one available. But this was developed by Dr. Steve Horvath um, using an elastic net regression method to identify 353 CPG dinucleotides, which are these epigenetic DNA methylation marks on sites across the genome that uniquely predicted um, with a high degree of correlation, high degree of accuracy, chronological age. So the first question was to look at, well, how does epigenetic age in our sample relate to chronological age? Does it relate to lifestyle and stress markers? And how well does it relate to some other markers that presumably also may reflect biological aging, like the telomere or mitochondrial DNA copy number was another one we were looking at. So we're looking at how they relate to age and also how they relate to each other. So um, to do this, um, we leveraged actually a study, as uh, a doc Dr. Janager was referring to, and also Dr. Hall, which was a vitamin trial. And this trial has been in the news uh, recently. It's called the Vitamin D and Omega-3 trial. Um, and I've been running an ancillary study that's going to be, as we finish crunching the numbers, looking at the depression endpoint within this vitamin D and omega-3 randomized trial. Um, but as a subset of that, we have um, a group of people who are very well characterized in terms of a wide array of of lifestyle, behavioral stress, psychological measures, cognitive function, and their midlife to older adults. We had cases who had a history of psychiatric illness and controls who did not. And uh, we looked at um, these biomarkers within them um, using blood samples from which we extracted DNA. Um, DNA methylation was measured using um, the Illumina um, Methylation Epic platform. And telomere and mitochondrial DNA were measured using PCR assay. And so what this slide illustrates is essentially that we see a correlation between DNA methylation age on chronological chronological age that is quite strong, close to 0.9, and this is consistent with what other people have found. It's a very tight correlation. We see, as we would expect, an inverse correlation of shorter telomere length with greater uh, chronological age, um, but we don't see a correlation for mitochondrial DNA copy number. So we're also interested in looking within this set um, how these, these biomarkers relate to each other. And surprisingly, there haven't really been many studies that have looked at all three of these intercorrelated. So this pilot was a really nice opportunity to try to get some sense of that. And we see a little bit of a relationship, an inverse correlation, as one might expect, between higher DNA methylation age and shorter telomere length, but not quite reaching statistical significance. But we didn't really see the relationship for mitochondrial DNA copy numbers. So it doesn't seem to relate as well as the other two. But moving forward, we really wanted to get a sense of how epigenetic aging is related to the modifiable lifestyle factors. So uh, setting up a, a situation in which we might think about, well, well, what are some changes we could make, for example, in health and behaviors um, that might portend um, lower epigenetic aging. Um, so in looking at DNA methylation age, telomere, and mitochondrial DNA copy number, the bottom line is within this relatively small sample, of course, it is a small sample, we really didn't see an association for the telomere uh, or the mitochondrial DNA copy number. And admittedly, this may have to do with just measurement precision and needing more people. But 
it turned out with DNA methylation, there was enough precision that we were able to see correlations with alcohol, um, at, with there being essentially higher DNA methylation age with alcohol, and a trend for smoking and BMI, and significantly inverse association of lower DNA methylation age with exercise frequency and metabolic equivalent task hours per week as total energy expenditure. But moreover, looking at psychological and stress factors, we found um, interesting associations here as well. We use a measure called the PHQ-9 of depression, where we didn't really see anything significant in terms of DNA methylation age or accelerated aging, but we saw a trend of a positive association. We used a metric of accelerated aging that's been developed by Dr. Horvath, um, and we found that actually higher anxiety was significantly associated with higher accelerated aging. So essentially, it's kind of an equation that um, maps out the extent to which e epigenetic aging is greater than expected compared to chronological age. So it's giving us a sense of um, whether there's a faster or accelerated uh, epigenetic aging. Um, by contrast, psychosocial support, which we measured as frequency of contact and quality of contact of psychosocial contacts, was inversely associated with DNA methylation age and measures of accelerated epigenetic aging. And also, intriguingly, we found that people who had higher cognitive functioning had lower epigenetic age, uh, lower uh, epigenetic age and age acceleration, um, using a, a very uh, high quality measure called the modified mini-mental state, or 3MS. So all of this has been very intriguing for us in terms of understanding the potential for these lifestyle modifiable factors and stress-related factors to relate to epigenetic aging. But a larger question, of course, that comes up is this is a small study, it's cross-sectional. And you know, Right here in Boston, um, we're having the Gerontologic Society of America meeting, annual meeting, um, which is uh, uh, where a lot of these topics are, are being discussed. And it's actually noted, and there's been a bit of a consensus among folks, um, that we really need longitudinal data for this. We really need to get a better sense of how these measures of epigenetic age track individuals over time and what it's really telling us about how targetable they are. So using something like the vital depth might be a way to do that. Um, and to try to understand not only influences of these vitamins and supplements on the target of epigenetic aging, but how they interact with baseline stress and psychological symptoms. And um, again, with great gratitude to the Osher Center, this pilot data was um, uh, enabled us to get funding from NIH that just came through last month to actually address that in a much larger sample within this vital DAP cohort. So I think I'll stop there so we don't run out of time, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olivia. Um, and so now we're going to uh, have our, our last talk before we do the panel. Continue to enter questions on Slido, um, especially you know, while I'm talking and nothing important is happening. Um, uh, so Dr. Manoj Basin is uh, an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and director of bioinformatics and systems biology at BIDMC. Um, he's also co-director of the BIDMC uh, Genomics, Proteomics, Bioinformatics, and Systems Biology Center, and a senior investigator at the uh, Harvard Medical School Vascular Biology Center. He's a close collaborator of ours at the Benson Henry Institute, and has used really cutting-edge uh, gen uh, genomics and other omics technologies, along with systems biology approaches, to identify key pathways and genes that are associated with the beneficial effects of mind and body approaches. He's going to be talking about some of this work, uh, specifically making the connection between mind-body practices and uh, changes in gene expression. Please welcome Manoj Basin. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Peter and Helen, for inviting me here. Uh, it's an exciting set of uh, speakers. So my lab uses uh, cutting-edge genome technologies like what Dr. Church talked, basically, like where I think most of the technologies came out of his lab, like how we can measure all the genes uh, at one go, like all 50,000 uh, transcripts, which correspond to around 30,000 genes, how can we measure them to really see, like, how does these mind-body techniques are altering them? So uh, this is uh, the crux my lab do. So we use all of the technologies measuring the expression of all the genes, all the proteins, uh, before and after mind-body intervention to really understand like how does these technologies really alter uh, our genes. Um, uh, 
So uh, the first study we did is, um, and all this work is done in close collaboration with Benson Henry Institute, and we have like a lot of studies open up with them. So the first study we did is uh, in 2008 and 2013, the repeat of that study, uh, where we took a group of novices and trained them with uh, mind-body intervention uh, for eight weeks, measured their genome four times at baseline and after eight weeks uh, to really see what are the changes happening in eight weeks. And then as a positive control, we added another group of individuals, uh, which are the long-term uh, meditators, which are doing yoga meditation from like uh, two years to 10 years as a positive control. And um, we measured uh, the genes at multiple times to really figure out like uh, what are the changes which are consistent, not the random noise, because the changes due to these technologies are pretty small changes. So what we learned is that there are two kind of changes in the genes uh, due to meditation. One changes we give in the name of progressive changes, means after eight weeks you see a small change, but that change is much bigger in the long-term meditators, like uh, these genes like start low, they go a little bit high up. Uh, after eight weeks, they go much uh, up in the long-term meditators. And second kind of changes we observed is, which are just in the long-term meditators, eight week of meditation has no effect on uh, those uh, set of genes. And to really understand like what are these genes which are like progressively impacted by mind-body interventions, we performed like uh, pathways analysis to really figure out like what are the biological things they do in our body, like how do they regulate different kind of processes in our body. So when we looked at the genes which are going progressively up, like uh, these are the genes, like uh, these are the novices, these are the short-term meditators, and these are the long-term meditators, you can see like they start from green and started going uh, toward red, so like genes are going up. So if we look at the genes which are progressively going up, they involved in mitochondrial and energy production. Uh, electron transport chain, and insulin secretion, basically. So these are not random genes which are changed by mind-body intervention. They are really upregulating the energy production, electron transport chain, and insulin secretion. That is the first message we got from uh, this data. Then the second is like, what is the genes which are going down progressively by the meditation? So when we looked at those genes and do the same pathways analysis, what we learned is that they mostly belong to inflammation pathways, IL-7 uh, and TCR signaling pathways. So they are all immune system focused pathways, mostly based on inflammation. So, but like what is the key pathway? We still keep on going on our data analysis because these are multiple pathways. Like is inflammation is driving it? IL-7 is driving it? Who is doing it? So we did system biology because in our system, like all the genes work in coordination with each other basically. They are different group of genes. They talk to each other if they want to carry out a particular kind of process. So when we did the system biology analysis, what we learned is that the genes which are progressively upregulated, they are mainly focused into mitochondria. They upregulate the ATPase complexes in our mitochondria, the expression of ATPase complexes, and the insulin gene itself is upregulated by eight weeks of meditation. Uh, and then if we look at the what is going down, we see like MAP kinases, uh, JUN, these are all the genes which interact with a transcription factor known as NF-kappa-B. And NF-kappa-B is the main gene that is responsible for uh, driving inflammation or very like strong association when you have a high level of NF-kappa-B, you have a more amount of inflammation. So that is down-regulated by uh, meditation uh, in eight weeks. So then we carried out like multiple other studies to really uh, see like is this hypothesis hold on. Uh, so we did a study in IBD, multiple myeloma. We did a study in hypertensive patient, PTSD uh, subjects. So uh, we recently published our hypertension study uh, where we took a uh, stage one hypertensive people and trained them with RR for eight weeks and measured their blood pressure changes as well as measured their genome level changes. So what we observed is that 54% of the patients uh, responded to mind-body intervention. Their blood pressure goes down significantly. Uh, both the systolic and diastolic blood pressure, they become normotensive. And we call these group of people like whose blood pressure goes down significantly as the 
responders and the group of people like whose blood pressure is not changing, we call them non-responders, and did the genomic comparison to really figure out like what is different in these two groups. One group is uh, behaving normal due to mind-body intervention, not the other group. So when we did the pathway analysis on this group, what we learned is that one of the pathway that is significantly going down in the responders as compared to non-responder is inflammation pathway. So this is like a, if the inflammatory genes go down, maybe the blood pressure will go down. Uh, that is the hint uh, we got from this data. And then we the system biology on these pathways which are going down in the responders but not in the non-responders and we again learned that one of the molecules that surface out as a key molecule for making all these genomic changes is NF-kappa B. So again it's a driver of inflammation and then we did like a meta-analysis in which like uh, oh, we looked through 21 different studies and try to understand like these are the, some of the studies done by our group as well as the studies done by other group across the world, uh, like to really understand like what they are observing. Do they observe like same kind of inflammatory uh, processes are down-modulated by mind-body interventions or not? So what we learned is that uh, one of the consensus that is emerging in the field is that most of the mind-body interventions, they down-modulate NF-kappa B, the main transcription factor that is associated with uh, inflammation. And this uh, transcription factor is involved in uh, like lot of diseases, like any chronic disease. You have a stress, any chronic disease, NF-kappa B levels goes up. And uh, we have like no evidences in mouse models, like if the cancer has more amount of inflammation, it will have less resolution and poor prognosis. So. If we can take care of this inflammation part by doing mind-body interventions, might be that will help uh, helpful uh, in better management uh, of uh, the diseases. Uh, so that, I think, is what uh, I would like to convey, that these mind-body interventions, they have genomic linkage, and they work through specific pathways in our genome, and they might be helpful in better management of the diseases by taking care of inflammation part of most of the chronic uh, diseases. Uh, that's it. And uh, I would like to thank my collaborators for this great amount of work. Yeah.